there. So let's let's go to the Lord in prayer now. And I want to, as we go to prayer, I want to pray especially for uh, for Catherine Lindsay White's um, parents who are both in the hospital this morning. So if you would pray just in your hearts along with me. Father, we just pray in the name of Jesus that you would help Catherine's dad, who appears to maybe have had a, a stroke, a minor stroke, Lord. Um, pray for him, God. Raise him up. Heal him. We pray for her mom, who is in the hospital as well with, uh, with pancreatitis, God. And so, Lord, these things are, are easily healed by you. You control all things, and you are the, the master physician. So I pray that this morning you would touch them and help them to draw close to you, Lord. And I pray for the message this morning, that you would just work through me, Lord, and I would be your mouthpiece. Lord, give us uh, ears to hear this morning, and I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm starting a uh, short series this morning on Obadiah. I don't know if you've ever heard a sermon series on Obadiah, but here it is, all right? So, very short book in the Old Testament, and we're going to be taking two weeks to go through it, and this is the first one. And so the first message here is entitled, The Peril of Pride. So I asked my wife, I said, give me some examples of when I have been proud in my life. And she said to me, well, how much time do you have? No, she actually, she didn't say that, but uh, she could have, and so she started giving me some examples, and so I wanted to share one with you this morning. So we'll go back to the time when, uh, when we were dating, and I would, you know, get a soft drink, two liter soft drink, and, you know, pour it, and then screw the cap back on and set it down. And she would come over, and she would grab the, the two liter soft drink and notice that it's not really tight. It's not all the way tightened down, and so she said to me, so you know if you if you tighten it all the way down, that'll prevent the fizz from coming out, and it'll last a little bit longer. And so I think I said, yeah, okay. And there was a certain look on my face that said, don't tell me what to do. I know about all this stuff. I'm just too smart for that. And she kind of read through that, and we talked about it later. Like, yeah, that, that's, that's true. That's a, that's a problem. You know what that's called? Pride. Yeah, pride. So I wonder if there's anyone here that knows someone with a pride issue this morning. Anyone knows someone with a pride issue anymore? Okay, wait a minute. I see some elbows going on right now, but what I want you to do is take your arm, hold your elbow up like this, okay, and then hit yourself in the gut, okay, all right, because we really all are the ones that have problems with pride, and we'll talk more about that as we go through the, the text this morning. So how do we overcome this problem of pride? And is it even a problem? I mean, it seems that the world says that pride, you need to have pride in yourself. You need to be proud of what you do. You, and it doesn't seem to uphold that value. But we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to learn three attitude changes that we need to have. As we walk through this text in Obadiah, three attitude changes we need to have to overcome this problem of pride. So I want to give you a little bit of background to this book this morning. So this is in the Old Testament, written uh, probably, this is during the time of King Jehoram, but there's different views on this, so we don't know exactly where they're in the Old Testament, but it was at a time frame when the, the Jews uh, were invaded by, by Edom, and Edom was uh, was rejoicing over that and ha happy about all that. And in Edom, it's to the south. So we go to that, that map, Edom. is to the south of Judah. And you'll notice that uh, when we go back to the Old Testament, that Edom is related to who? Esau. Esau. So, so God promised Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. And Jacob's name changed to Israel, and Jacob had a brother named Esau, a twin brother. And these guys were always struggling against each other. They did that in the womb, and then after that, for many years, the two nations struggled all the time. I don't know if you, any of you have a brother or sister like that. No, no, no names, okay, no elbowing. Uh, you know, that brother and sister that just irritates you all the time. Maybe they're pulling pranks on you, maybe they're digging you, and the ribs, and they're always saying things about you. Well, they take that and magnify it about a thousand times. Esau and Jacob, Edom and Israel, always fighting against each other. We see that 
when it comes to the time of the New Testament. You've got Jesus on the one hand with, with Jacob, descending from Jacob, and then you've got King Herod descending from Edom, and King Herod the Great and King Herod uh, Antipas at the time of Jesus' death. And so this battle has been, been taking place, and it's been taking place throughout history. So, so let's take a look at the first point to see how we can overcome pride. And we need to understand what pride is and why God hates it. What it is and why God hates it. And the first point is you've got to recognize that pride is characterized by self-deception and self-sufficiency. That's what pride is. It's when you deceive yourself that you can be self-sufficient. It's just really, when you take it down its roots, it's independence from God. Thinking that you can live outside of God's strength. Uh, when we look through this text, we're going to see the word pride, and the word pride in Hebrew is Zedan, and that, that word is actually literally the boiling of water. And you know the bubbles that are coming up, and they're, they're big, and they're puffed up, and they're coming to the top. Well, that's the picture of, of pride, thinking that you are all that when really everything that you have comes from God. Every good thing that you have comes from God and depends upon God. Paul talked about this in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 4, 6. He was telling the Corinthians, you're being puffed up. You're being proud. And then he says this in 1 Corinthians 4, 7. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? If you can dunk a basketball backwards, it's not because of all because of you, it's because God gave you that gift. And that you can do that. If you can, if you're good at your, your job, you're good at um, as a sport, you're good at another skill, or whatever, you're, you have an outgoing personality, all that comes from God. And so when we think we, we don't have it, it's not dependent upon Him, then it's pride. So let's take a look at, at the Edomites and their pride and the prophecy against that in Obadiah chapter 1. Verse 1, the vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, we have heard a report from the Lord and a messenger has been sent among the nations, rise up, let us rise against her for battle. So Obadiah gets this vision from the Lord and he's going to send out a report to the nations. It's time for, for the nations now to rise up and take down Edom. Edom has been puffed up and proud, Edom has been antagonizing my nation Israel, my special people, and now it's time for the nations to rise up and to take Edom down several notches. And Edom thinks there's no chance that this could happen because they're so well protected, they're so powerful, they're so wise. Look at verse 2. Behold, I will make you small among the nations, and you shall be utterly despised. So he says, you know, you are going to be, you think you're big, you're going to become small. You're going to become despised among all the nations. You're going to go down. You've got your nose up, but you're about to ready to walk over a cliff because you're deceived. Look at verse 3. Here we see the, the deception. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagles, though you, your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. You see, our pride deceives us, and we, we think that we're, we're so great. And it's deceived Edom, thinking, oh, we can never fall. We can never go down. See, they lived in, uh, in the mountain of Seir, and in that range, in those mountains, they had all these rocks, and so they were in this area where they were surrounded by rocks so it was almost impenetrable to come and defeat them. And so they, they felt very secure. They felt like they had the place that no one could take them over, and they thought we're really wise and we're smart. No one's going to, no one can take us down. And it's in a lot of it, see how they said it's in their heart, they said, who's going to take us down? No one can. And so much of the time, pride actually starts in our heart and it's not noticeable to others. We walk around thinking these things in our heart. We think, 
I could never commit that sin. A lot of times Christians say that. I could never commit, you know, adultery. Or I could never abuse another person. Or I, I could never lie like that person did. I could never steal. Oh, I could, oh, I would never do that. Well, be careful. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. I think we should all in our hearts say, you know what, Lord, if if it weren't for the grace of God, I could commit any sin that there is out there. You name it, I could do it. And I think that's the attitude that we need to have. Anything, any sin is possible for us to commit if it wasn't for the grace of God. I think C.S. Lewis said it well when he said this. He said, if you think you are not conceited, it means you are very conceited indeed. And I think that we can take home today to remember, if you think, I don't have any pride, I don't have a problem with pride, and you've got a problem with pride, let me tell you right now, we all have a problem with pride. Pride is really the root of sin. It's not as explicit in Scripture, but so many Christian uh, believers over the centuries have said this, and I think it's true. I mean, Augustine and Aquinas and C.S. Lewis have noticed that, that at the root of it is of sin is pride. I mean, think about the beginning. The first sin committed by Lucifer, Satan, Ezekiel chapter 28, the most powerful and beautiful angel, and he falls. Look at verse 16. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst, and you sinned. So I cast you off as a profane thing from the mountain of God. I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I expose you before kings to feast their eyes on you. Why did Satan fall? Because of pride. Why did Adam and Eve sin in the garden? Because they didn't want to listen to what God said because they knew which is best. I can go take the fruit of the you know, knowledge of good and evil. And so it's pride. Now, but you can also swing the pendulum so far in the other direction, you do something else we can do, which is also pride, it's just another name for it, called false false humility. See, in the middle you have humility, over here you have pride, but over here you have false humility. This is when we say, woe is me, I can't do anything right, I'm no good. There's nothing good about me. And we're just always, you know, beating ourselves up and being so down. And, but really, that's a form of pride because we're not looking at ourselves the way God looks at us. Because look at Romans 12, 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. So you shouldn't be thinking, oh, I'm so great. But at the same time, to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Every person is given a gift. Every person has something to offer because God has given it to them. And so you see yourself in light of that. But your confidence is in Christ. It's never in yourself. Any type of self-confidence is not the right kind of confidence. Confidence in Christ is where our confidence has to be in every area of our life. And so the balance is in humility in between those two extremes. So how do we overcome it? Well, just like anything else, the first step to overcoming pride is admitting that you have a pride problem. So welcome to Arrogance Anonymous this morning, okay? I'm glad to have you here and join us at the meeting this morning. Hi, my name is Mike Bauer, and I have a problem with pride. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Good. Nice to meet you. It's your turn now. All right, you ready to say that with me? In the moment, you're going to say, hi, my name is, put your name in here. And you say, I have a problem with pride. Are you ready? Let's go. One, two, three. Oh, well, good. It's good to have you here. All right, we're making progress. All right, we've admitted it. We have a problem with pride. That's the first step. And now we can overcome it 
by the grace of God. So that's the first attitude change you got to have is recognizing that you have a problem with pride, and I have a problem with pride, and also realize that our pride is going to bring destruction. It brings destruction on others, and it, what goes around comes around and destroys us. And that's what happened with the Edomites. I mean, this, this principle is taught by us in the New Testament as well. Paul said, Galatians 6, 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, he will also reap. What you sow, you will reap. In the same way, God was not mocked with Edom. Let's look at verses uh, 5 and 6. If thieves came to you, if plunderers came by night, how you have been destroyed. Would they not steal only enough for themselves? If, if grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? How Esau has been pillaged and his treasures sought out. So he says, look, if a thief came in and when it came into your house at night, they wouldn't steal absolutely everything in your house. They would take the things that they want and they would get out and leave. If someone was harvesting grapes, they, they go in and they harvest the grape field, but then they leave the gleanings, they leave some of the grapes on the sides so that the poor can harvest them. But you, Edom, I'm going to come and pillage the whole thing. I'm going to take you down all the way down to the bottom because what you have sown, you're going to reap. You have been deceptive, and now deception is going to come back to haunt you. You thought you'd been so wise, and now your wisdom is going to be brought down. Look at verse 7. What goes around comes around. Verse 7, all, all your allies have driven you to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. They have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you. You have no understanding. You see, they thought they were so wise. They thought that they knew so much, and now it's coming back to haunt them. And they, they had set up these, they had allies with different nations so that they could, you know, antagonize Israel, and now those nations are going to come against them. What goes around comes around. There's a story of a, of a colonel. He just got a rank advancement, and he was very excited about it, and so he was in his office, and uh, at that, and when he's in his office thinking about how great it was to be a colonel, he got a knock on the door, and, and he heard outside the door someone say, Hello, this is Private Jackson. May I come in? And so he thought, oh, i got to do something. So he grabbed a phone. He picked up the phone, and he said, uh, Hello, Mr. President. Yes, thank you so much for calling. I, oh, yeah, I, I appreciate you congratulating me. Yeah, thank you very much. And then he said, uh, who is it? And he said, Private Jackson. Like, oh, okay, come on in, Private Jackson. Sorry, Mr. President. I'm sorry I'm being interrupted right now. And so, what do you want, Private Jackson? Oh, uh, I just came in to connect your phone. <laughs> so, and his pride lifted him up, but popped and down he went. All right, and that's what happens to us. You know, we do that. We sow pride, and we're going to reap destruction. There was, a, there was a man who was driving one day, and he was driving really close. He liked to get behind the cars behind him. I don't know if you know anyone like this, but he'd drive really close and then slam on the brakes at the last second. And his eight-year-old son was in the car with him, and the eight-year-old son said, Dad, maybe you should slow down a little bit and not get so close to the car in front of you. And he's like, oh, you don't tell me what to do. I've been driving for 25 years. I know how to drive. I've only had three accidents hitting someone behind. You don't tell me what to do. And he just went off on his son. His son's all dejected. And so then we fast forward eight years later. Now his son is 16, and his son's in the driver's seat driving, and he's in the seat next to him. And so he's driving along, and he's behind the car in front of him, and he slams on the brakes and barely stops just in time. And his dad's like, would you slow down, slow down, come on. You're, you're going way too fast. And then, Son said, hey, Dad, I've been driving for two months. I know how to drive, you know. I know how to stop in time. And you see, he's planted this seed of pride. And what you sow is what you get. And that's what will show up in your family. That will show up in your friends. That will show up in your relationships. 
Are you sowing seeds of pride? We all are to an extent. So let's ask the Lord, God, drive the pride out of me. I, I, I see what it is. Show me where I'm living with pride. Because if we don't, ultimately, God will squash our pride. Obadiah 8 through 9. And it just it reminds me of, you know, when kids have bubbles and they're blowing bubbles up in the air and they're all floating all around. And then most of the bubbles pop, but a few will stay on the ground. What do the kids do when they're on the ground, those bubbles are sitting on the ground? Just stomp on it. It's so much fun. Well, God will squish our pride if we choose to hang on to it. Look at verses 8 and 9. This is what he, he's going to do to the Edomites. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of Mount Esau? And your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Teman, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. And he said, look, you're, you're wise. I know you're wise. And they, they had some privilege to have wisdom because they were on the trade route in between India and Europe. So they would get a lot of different information that maybe other places wouldn't get. They had communication with Babylon and Egypt. And so they did have some wisdom. They did know some things that maybe other people didn't know, but it just puffed them up and made them so proud. Let me ask you, do you, do you know or do you know of any Edomites today? No, there are no Edomites. They're gone. Uh, they were swallowed up after Roman, the Romans came in in 70 A.D., and they actually fought with Israel this one time, but they were, they were put down by the Romans and finally just f totally came to non-existence. God's prophecy came true. And this is the story, really, of, of the Bible, of pride and God having to put down pride and lifting up the humble. Let me go back to what we talked about before. Satan in his pride said, I'm going after what I want to do, not what you want, God. And so then you have Adam and Eve was puffed up. They were puffed up in pride. And because of that, God had to send his son, Jesus Christ, who was humble, the most humble person ever to live. Jesus Christ came from heaven. He has all the riches, all the power, all the glory. He lives a perfect life for you and me. And then on the cross, here he is hanging on the cross, totally humiliated on the cross, suffering for us, taking all our pride, all our sin, all our defensiveness, all our stubbornness, all our self-sufficiency, all our bragging. He suffered for it there on the cross. He paid the price for all our pride on the cross so that we wouldn't have to be crushed like he was crushed on the cross. And then he was buried, and he showed that he had victory over sin, Satan, and the, and the devil, and all our stubbornness, and he rose from the dead. And if you would humble yourself and put your faith in him and trust him and trust that because he was crushed for you, you won't be crushed one day for your pride. That you'll be forgiven. That you'll have eternal life with him forever and ever. You will be forgiven. Your name will be put in the Lamb's book of life and you will be with him forever. So I urge you this morning, if you've never put your trust alone in Christ, do that. You can pray and say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I deserve to be crushed, and I know I deserve to go to hell, and I know there's no way I can earn my way back to you. I have no goodness in myself, but I trust in your son, Jesus Christ, that he died for me, and he was buried, and he rose from the dead. I'm trusting you to save me and forgive me, give me eternal life right now. You can do that right now and know Christ, and have all that pride forgiven and taken care of. I urge you to do that this morning. If you do, you can write that on the card near you, and then when we pass the baskets out, put that on the card and let us know that you've trusted Christ, just like those young boys did at the Good News Club this week. 
Now, if you are a believer, God sends his Holy Spirit inside of you when you trust Christ. And what his job is to do is to chisel away the pride in our life little by little. And does it hurt? Let me see here. Let me try this out. Here we go. Yeah, it hurts. It hurts. He comes up to us in the Holy Spirit and is convicting us lovingly but truthfully. Stubbornness. It's got to go. Defensiveness. Got to chisel it out. Self-sufficiency. Got to chisel it out. Living independently from God. Got to chisel it out. Prayerlessness, which is one of the deepest forms of pride because it's independence from God. Got to chisel it out. And he'll do it, and he does it in love, and he does it in grace. But he does it so that one day we will stand before him and look at him, and he'll look at us and say, Well done, my good and faithful.